Let us read further in God's Word, turning again to the book of Proverbs in the Old Testament. This morning, Proverbs chapter 3. Proverbs chapter 3, in our Pew Bibles, page 561. Proverbs chapter 3. This is the Word of God. My son, do not forget my law, but let your heart keep my commandments. For length of days and long life and peace they will add to you. Let not mercy and truth forsake you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. And so find favor and high esteem in the sight of God and man. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct your paths. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. It will be health to your flesh and strength to your bones. Honor the Lord with your possessions and with the first fruits of all your increase. So your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine. My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor detest his correction, for whom the Lord loves. He corrects, just as a father, the son in whom he delights. Happy is the man who finds wisdom and the man who gains understanding, for her proceeds are better than the profits of silver and her gain than fine gold. She is more precious than rubies and all the things you may desire cannot compare with her. Length of days is in her right hand, in her left hand riches and honor. Her ways are ways of pleasantness and all her paths are peace. She is a tree of life to those who take hold of her, and happy are all who retain her. The Lord, by wisdom, founded the earth. By understanding, he established the heavens. By his knowledge, the depths were broken up, and clouds dropped down the dew. My son, let them not depart from your eyes. Keep sound wisdom and discretion, so they will be life to your soul and grace to your neck. Then you will walk safely in your way, and your foot will not stumble. When you lie down, you will not be afraid. Yes, you will lie down, and your sleep will be sweet. Do not be afraid of sudden terror, nor of trouble from the wicked when it comes. For the Lord will be your confidence, and will keep your foot from being caught. Do not withhold good from those to whom it is due, when it is in the power of your hand to do so. Do not say to your neighbor, go and come back, and tomorrow I will give it when you have it with you. Do not devise evil against your neighbor, for he dwells by you for safety's sake. Do not strive with a man without cause if he has done you no harm. Do not envy the oppressor and choose none of his ways, for the perverse person is an abomination to the Lord, but his secret counsel is with the upright. The curse of the Lord is on the house of the wicked, but he blesses the home of the just. Surely he scorns the scornful, but gives grace to the humble. The wise shall inherit glory, but shame shall be the legacy of fools. Here ends the reading of God's holy word. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. Amen. Our text for this morning's uh, service is going to be all of Proverbs 3, so I encourage you to have it open before you. We're, as we work our way through these chapters, in, in many ways we're, we're doing the, the bird's eye view, hopefully helping us to get a sense of the overall picture and uh, giving you context to begin to appreciate some of the individual texts more. So Proverbs 3 and the other congregation, the theme that's before us really is uh, in verse 13. Happy is the man who finds wisdom. 
Happy is the man who finds wisdom. And of course, we can apply that to all of us, not just the man, but it's a general statement. So man, woman, boy, girl, happy is everyone, whoever finds wisdom. Yes, we can say happy are the wise, the wise. So happy, in fact, for as the text goes on to say, her proceeds are better than the profits of silver. She's worth more to you than all that money can gain. Yes, and her gain than fine gold. She is more precious than rubies. And all the things you may desire cannot compare with her. What comprehensive statements uh, are being made here. Length of days is in her right hand. In her left hand, riches and honor. Her ways are ways of pleasantness. And all her paths are peace. She is a tree of life to those who take hold of her. And happy, there's that word again, happy are all who retain her or more literally even hold her fast. I wonder, do you believe that this morning? Do you believe that happy, blessed ultimately are the wise? Do we believe that? And Do we reflect that in our life? So in all our priorities and in all our pursuits, and yes, also as parents, do we reflect it to our children too? Making sure to teach them and to show them wisdom matters more than anything else. It is not happy are the healthy. It is not happy are the wealthy. It is happy are the wise, all who find wisdom. Well, this morning we want to think about this theme as we go further in this book of Proverbs today as we survey chapter 3. As you can see, it's further counsel from a father to a son. You can't miss that in the text. Three times, in fact, we hear the phrase, my son, my son, verse 1, verse, verse 11, and verse 21. A father is teaching his son, and a father is appealing to his son. My son, he is saying. And then he is saying all kinds of things. It is a packed chapter, as we could, we could read together. But, but it all fits together under this theme of happy are the wise. Because that is the father's ultimate conviction. That is the truth, you might say, that drives him to say all that he says. And let's be clear, he is so passionate He is so intense in his talk. He's not just making some passing comments uh, to his son as they they happen to to, to walk by each other in the house. He's not just offering a few thoughts or suggestions or even some good advice. Hey, by the way, no, this is a father who is wrestling for the soul of his son. This is a father who is persuaded of the beauty and glory of wisdom. Wisdom. He understands, for example, how old wisdom is, how deep and how good. He refers in verse 19 to the fact that the Lord by wisdom founded the earth. By understanding, he established the heavens. So the wisdom of God is written written into all of creation. By his knowledge, the depths were broken up and the clouds dropped down the dew. What infinite wisdom this is and it can be found and it must be sought and this chapter together with all of proverbs is an urgent and an earnest summons to all who hear to become wise and to seek that wisdom that is from above because happy are the wise happy like no other happy happy here and now and happy forever and ever Happy are the wise. That's our theme. That's our theme. And to help convey the intensity of the chapter, I've, what I've done is I've put our two points in terms of exclamations, because to, to, to bring out the passion of, of the chapter. Exclamations. And the first, the first point is this. In terms of happy are the wise, what guidance they receive. What guidance they receive. Well, Who doesn't need guidance today? 
And wise people love guidance. And wise people may receive guidance like no other. That's part of the blessing of wisdom. Do we not hear that in this chapter? I mean, all the teaching about so many matters. Maybe you noticed when we read it, how hard it is to put everything together under one theme in a sense. I mean, that's one of the challenges when reading Proverbs, that, that so much gets covered. Especially later in, in the book, many times every new verse is a new subject, a new theme, a new idea, a new issue, a new point. And you get the sense that Solomon wants to try and cover everything under the sun if he can. And we find that in this chapter as well, to some extent. Just notice, the, for example, the, the many insights offered into many areas of life. How many different topics are addressed. Like in verse 5 and 6, famously. How to think about your own pathway through life. And how crucial it is not to be independent, but God-dependent. And with that also related, verse 7, not to be wise in your own eyes. So not to think or act or live as if you know it all. But to live in reverence. To live in godliness. What about in verse 9 and 10 in relation to material possessions and honoring the Lord with your stuff. And then too in verses 11 and 12, how to respond to divine discipline. And later in verses 27 through 30, we can talk about how to deal with our employees and our neighbors and the people we live with. And then in verse 31 and following, the issue of oppressors and perverse people, negative and harmful people in our life, how to deal with them. And the point is, so many issues are getting packed into this chapter. So many situations in life are being considered. And wisdom, true wisdom, offers good insight, solid insight into them all. How to think about all these things. And not just insight, but direction. Direction, as in, here is what to do. Because that's important too, isn't it? Wisdom in the Bible is not simply knowing some things, being sharp on some facts. But wisdom in the Bible is knowing how to live and to live well. And then living like that. It's all about character and and pleasing the Lord. We could read in verses 3 and 4 about mercy and truth. In a way, summaries of, of the whole life of wisdom. You could also translate loyalty and truth, or being faithful and true. And the point is, how we live matters. And that's what this Father's counsel is all about. He's wanting to pack truth into the head of his son in such a way that the life of the son is transformed by that truth. Are we faithful people? Are we merciful people? Are we truthful people? See, that's the burden of the father. It's like we read in James chapter 3, where James at the end of the chapter contrasts the wisdom that is from below, from the earth, and the wisdom that is from above. And he says in verse 17 that the wisdom that is from above is, is pure, and it is peaceable, and it is gentle, and it is willing to yield, and it is full of mercy and good fruits, and it is without partiality and without hypocrisy. So the point being, it's for behavior, it's for conduct, it's for how we live out everyday Life And the wise people then, they follow instructions, they receive understanding and they obey directions. They live according to the wisdom of the all-wise God. And this chapter lays out some of that. Like in terms again of that big picture of your life, here's, here's how to live your life. Trust the Lord with all your heart. Don't trust your own mind and heart. No, trust Him. And then with your riches, honor the Lord with all you've been given, with everything that comes to you. In those days, of course, everyone or most people were agriculturalists. Everyone had their own small farm. That is why Solomon talks about first fruits and barns and wine vats. 
It's the language of the day. But the point is, honor the Lord with your income, with your assets, with your property, with your possessions. Honor Him with all your wealth. For one thing, giving something back to Him and ultimately stewarding it well. And what about if you're passing through hard times? If the way of providence in your life is not easy, but grievous, how do we think about that? How do we handle that? Well, again, isn't the counsel of verse 11 and 12 so profound and powerful when he says, do not despise God's chastening. Do not detest His correction. So that's what to do or what not to do. And the implication, of course, is to receive the discipline, to submit to it. And why? Well, verse 12 explains it's not punishment. God's not whipping you. No, He's, he's loving you. He's doing whatever it is because He cares for you, because you're a son, because you're a daughter. And He's being a faithful father to you. He's doing what all good fathers do. He's making sure that you as His child stay close, stay good and faithful. Isn't that what we as fathers with our children seek to do? And with our words if we can. And with the rod as it were only if we have to. Only because that's the best way to learn perhaps something. But always because we love. We love them. And isn't this good counsel? What insight we may receive through wisdom. What insight and direction. Understanding what is happening. Understanding what to do and how to respond. And the way to live. What about when evil people rise up against us? Maybe suddenly, terribly. What should we think? How should we feel? What should be our response? Or think about how important it is to treat our neighbor fairly and kindly, including people who work for us, or else people who live by us, or even maybe people who live with us in our own house, treating them fairly and kindly. Because that's right. Because that makes sense. Yes, because that's the way of wisdom. And again, in a way, we're, we're just skimming over the surface of the chapter, but the point is to see how many issues are being addressed and all the help we may receive and why we may also say then, as the Father says here, happy are the wise, because the wise have access to all this counsel and guidance for life in this world. The wise know what is going on and they know what to do. And isn't it true that if you are not truly wise, you don't really know. Don't we just have to look around in society to be confirmed in that? With so many people rejecting the way of true wisdom as may be found in the Lord Jesus Christ and how often and how terribly that shows up also in their life. They don't have a clue what is going on or how to live in this world and how to live it well. Think of how many people, for instance, wander, wander blindly through life and if they look for guidance, they look in all the wrong places. They chase after astrologers and palm readers and horoscopes. Or else they are so full of their own opinions, so high on themselves, and yet in truth so confused as to what is true and real and good and right. How many people look only to man, whether it's to themselves or to others. And it's all about the help of man. But the Bible says the help of man is vain. But they have no care for God. They have no interest in seeking Him. And meanwhile they are lost. They are utterly and totally lost. If we think of the state of the family, for instance, in the world at large, how many people's family lives are in total shambles. And what confusion they reflect. What a mess they have made. And it's all because they have no true guidance. Indeed, we are living in days when, when supposedly bright and popular and influential people 
are so bold and so foolish as to say it is no longer possible to tell the difference between a boy and a girl. And it's a reflection of this very point. They have no wisdom. They have no guidance. How many people can't manage their money? How many people are in deep financial trouble through lack of God's wisdom, through lack of any understanding? How many people, when trials come, tests, when life is tough, they do anything but turn to God, they turn on God, they blame God, they criticize God, or they reject Him? How many people get totally undone when any threat or danger appears? How many people do not know how to be neighborly? If they have a business, they don't manage their people very well. They don't treat them very well. Or else they're not good neighbors in our streets, in our towns and communities. How many people pick fights? How many people get so angry at others for seemingly small, insignificant reasons? How many people are consumed by envy and perversity? Why is that? It is because they are not wise and they have no guidance. And even if they do succeed at some things, sure, they may be good businessmen or good doctors or good teachers. Many people do excel at some things in their life, at their trade, at their craft, in their careers. Many people have learned at some level to be students, to be teachable, but always so that they retain the sovereign position, so that they're in charge still. And that's, but to the extent that they are teachable is due in, in a measure to God's common grace, and we, we may be thankful for that. And yet, while even some are good at some things, without this wisdom that is from above, they cannot have access to all there is to know and to understand and to receive and to embrace. And their lives at some point, in some way, will reflect it. They may be good at work, but they may well be terrible at home. Or they may know how to manage their money, but they can't manage their own hearts. Or they may be nice enough neighbors, but in private, they are blatantly immoral. You see, if you will not be wise, you will live ultimately in darkness. Only the wise can understand and can discern. Only the wise receive the guidance of the living God. That is why Solomon says, happy are the wise. Do we see that this morning, congregation? Do we see it for our own selves? Especially if we are among the wise. I mean, if you have heard the call of wisdom and have learned to embrace that way through faith in Jesus Christ, and you're on that pathway of learning from Him, what a blessing to be able to receive guidance for all of life. Of course, Christ brings us so many things. He brings us ultimately the forgiveness of sins and peace with God the Father and access into His presence and hope for eternal life. But you know, on the way to that, He also brings us all these resources of wisdom and understanding, insight and direction. And that's not to, that's not to think that we automatically know everything that is to be known or that immediately in every situation we understand what is best and what to do. It, that's not true. I mean, for all kinds of reasons, we can struggle still and even err. That's true. And yet, through wisdom, we may have access to God's infinite counsel. Through wisdom, we may live close to Him who is all wise and who says, follow me. Follow me. How blessed we may be then if we are wise. Happy are the wise. Let's never forget that. The value of wisdom's guidance. And let's make sure also to be regularly listening to wisdom. We have access to a treasure that is so great and so deep and so glorious and too often we bypass it. We who ought to know better and we live lives still leaning on our own understanding as opposed to being taught by God through His Word and by His Spirit. Happy are the wise, first of all, what guidance they receive. But secondly, what blessings they enjoy. What blessings they enjoy. Can you see this point throughout the chapter? 
I mean in verse 2 already. In terms of remembering the Father's law and keeping His commands with your heart. Verse 2 says, For length of days and long life and peace they will add to you. And then in verse 4, when you wisely combine mercy and truth and you are faithful, you will find favor and high esteem in the sight of God and man. Verse 6, when you acknowledge the Lord in all your ways, He will direct your paths. And when you make sure also to be sober in your own self-assessment, and not to live so proudly or so self-confidently with regard to your own self, when you're modest and humble, then that will generally lead to health and strength. Because you will be teachable. You will follow good instruction. You will learn to take care of yourself and your life as God directs you in His Word. And so also when you honor the Lord with your wealth, with your riches, He will bless you in that. Down to verse 23, when you are seeking to be wise, that will mean walking safely through life. Not stumbling along the way. Even sleeping well. Now we have to understand this correctly, of course. We have to understand that the Father here, He is he's not speaking in terms of absolute promises, but He is laying out principles. That's an important distinction to remember when we read the Proverbs. That we're not talking now about promises so much as principles. If, if we take, for instance, verse 7 and 8, all about not being wise in our own eyes, but fearing the Lord and departing from evil. And then how that will lead to health to our flesh and strength to our bones. You know, the point is not that if you're truly Christian, you will never get sick. That can't be the point. If you are truly Christian, you will never get sick. How many Christians over the years, they do get sick. And meanwhile, they have been some of the wisest and godliest there have been. See, in all of life we have to acknowledge the sovereignty of God, His infinite wisdom, and the fact that He has a plan for all His people. And His way, including the details, whatever even the hard details there may be, His way is always perfect. And so sometimes in the way of wisdom, we may still suffer. We may still struggle. Say, for example, we, we steward our resources very well. We're generous and sacrificial even in our giving. And we do so cheerfully and joyfully. And yet, in spite of that, we enter into hard times financially. Suffer loss. What is that? Does that mean that Proverbs 3, verse 9 and 10 isn't true? true? About honoring the Lord and He will, with your, with your abundance and He will make everything to overflow? Is it not true then? Or, or is it only true for some people and not for others? Or, or did we do something wrong? Well, not necessarily. It may simply be that in spite of all we have been given, and all we have done with it, still, for whatever reason, God leads us into a valley of need, of hardship. Maybe He has lessons to teach us that we couldn't otherwise learn. Who knows all that He is up to? Who is able to search all of His understanding? And yet, in spite of that, the Proverbs are still true because they are principles. They aren't absolute promises. They are principles. In other words, they are the way things generally go. They are the way that God generally works. They are the way that He has built this world. The way that He has established the moral order. How He chooses generally to regulate and govern the life of His people. If we walk in the way of obedience some kind of blessing is likely to follow. Indeed, blessing will follow, though the details of it will not always be plain. And that is what is being pointed out in this chapter, that principle above all. And this whole book even lays it out, that God loves to bless obedience to His Word. God blesses the wise. Isn't that what we teach our children? That blessing leads to obedience? Or, sorry, obedience leads to blessing? And isn't that what we also experience? Can we not all who have been taught by the Lord and are being taught by Him see it in some way in our life? Like we read in verse 33 that God blesses the home 
of the just. And this then is why the overall point, happy are the wise. Because, see, what blessings they enjoy. Many times, temporally speaking, many times. But maybe in view of all of this, it is good to pause and ask ourselves a question. If, if for any of us, things in our life are not going so well, is it possible that a reason for that might be that we are not living wisely? If we are experiencing no blessing, is it because we are not seeking to be wise in turning to God? in Jesus Christ, and in turning from all known sin. We have to be very careful, obviously, in asking this question, because elsewhere the Bible is clear that Jesus' path for his people includes, for instance, self-denial and cross-bearing. And Christians, too, take part in all of the sufferings of this broken world, this broken creation including being liable to sickness and depression and other things. And all of that is within the providence of God and for His people. And He works it for their good. He overrules all in His love and care. So we have to be careful as we think this through. And yet still, in in view of this chapter, in view of the teaching of Proverbs, it is worth asking the question, each of us, if we are struggling in life, Maybe, maybe stumbling all over the place. Maybe making a mess of, of things, of, of relationships or of finances or in work or something else. If, if in any way we are not doing well, is it possible that one reason for that might be that we are not living very wisely? In view of the chapter and the teaching of it, shouldn't we at least ask that question. Many years ago, we had friends, my wife and I had friends who were suffering some losses. It was a a couple and the details don't really matter, but in conversation at one point, the husband said, he said that in response to all that has happened, all that we have lost, in response to it, we have searched our own hearts to see if we are in any way living in sin. And his conclusion, or their conclusion, was, was no. They, they couldn't identify anything in particular, though we all stumbled in many things, of course. But they couldn't identify anything. And so they aimed to trust the Lord in the midst of their losses. But, but the point is to say that that exercise, that, that vulnerability to being searched out by the Lord can be good for us all, can't it? Search me, David says in Psalm 139. See what wicked way there be in me. And that's a question that we sometimes need to ask. Especially also when we may be struggling. Maybe could it be the reason why some also among us are struggling is exactly this point, that you're not living so wisely or truly. But what if like that couple that I just mentioned, what if we have to say no, we do not see any way in our life that is obviously wicked or sinful. What if even you do find sin and you repent of it truly and consistently and still still you struggle and still there seems to be so little blessing? How do we understand that? What if, for instance, in spite of living justly, so far as we can tell, our home doesn't get so blessed. Or we don't seem to experience so much grace. What if instead the perverse people seem to be prospering, the wicked doing very well, and the scornful succeeding? What if the fools have no shame, seem instead to have all the glory, while the shame appears to be heaped on us? See, that's the question. How do we understand our text when sometimes this chapter, when sometimes it doesn't appear to be true. Isn't it at this point that we have to remember that as much as the Proverbs are generally true in this life and over the course of life, 
They are generally true in this life and over the course of life, yet they find their ultimate fulfillment in the life to come. So that as we embrace wisdom and the way of wisdom, and as we seek to live wisely in these days of our lives, whatever blessing we experience here or not, in terms of what is to come, the Lord has in store only infinite blessing, all glorious blessing. And we could work this we could work this principle out throughout the entire chapter, but for sake of time, let's just do so in terms of the last four verses, starting at verse thirty two, where Solomon says, The perverse person is an abomination to the Lord. Now that's always true whether we see it or not. But we may not see it many times here, but we will see it in eternity. And likewise, in eternity, the secret counsel of the Lord is with the upright, or the close, intimate friendship of the Lord, that's really the idea there, is with the upright. That will be clear in eternity. They will see His face, we read in Revelation. So also verse 33, the curse of the Lord is on the house of the wicked, but He blesses the home of the just. Maybe not so clear here, but will be clear in eternity. Verse 34, surely he scorns the scornful, but gives grace to the humble. And finally, verse 35, the wise shall inherit glory, but shame, think everlasting shame, shall be the legacy of fools. And see, it's when you bring this eternal perspective to bear on the truth of our word that the glory of it begins to shine. Now we understand Happy are the wise because of the blessings they enjoy. If not here, though many times here, but if not here, then for sure and forever in the future. And we're to let that perspective be ever with us and be guiding us and helping us. And is that not also the mark of every true Christian, every wise man, woman and child? We aren't living for our brief time here on earth. Why would we? God has promised infinite blessings in the future when the Savior comes again. And so we set our hearts on that. We set our eyes on that. We set our hopes on that. I'm thinking of that yet, how it underscores, how it underscores how the ultimate point and call of wisdom is to belong to God in Jesus Christ. Not just to learn a few principles for life, but to meet with a person and to belong to this person, Jesus, the Savior. That's wisdom. That's ultimately what it means to be wise, to turn from all our sin, from all our self, and to turn to Him and trust in Him. Why is that the key? Isn't it because He only and ever and always was perfectly wise, like we all ought to be? Only He was merciful and truthful in a perfect way. Only He trusted the Lord consistently and throughout His life and did not lean on His own understanding. Only He was truly and thoroughly humble, all the time fearing the Lord and departing from evil. How He honored the Lord with His abundance. Well, what few possessions He had. How He was totally submissive also to His Father's guidance and direction. How He was only totally good and fair and kind and loving to all His neighbors. Jesus was the wise man like no one else. And He was that in virtue of who He was. But He was that also for the likes of you and me. And then, in the end of His life, He was sacrificed. Yes, he gave himself on the cross. And what was going on on the cross was that in those hellish moments he was being treated, you know, as an abomination. The perverse person is an abomination to the Lord. And there on the cross, the Savior was treated as an abomination by the Father himself. Yes, the curse of the Lord fell on him. And the scorn and wrath and judgment of a holy God. Yes, even infinite shame was piled onto the Son as He hung there in the place of sinners, in the place of fools. And only in Him can we be pardoned and righteous. 
and acceptable to God. And that is why ultimate wisdom is to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Apart from Him, we can never be wise enough. Apart from Him, we cannot even begin to be wise. Yes, apart from Him, we face only the curse of God and the scorn of God and the shame of God. The contrast couldn't be clearer, could it? How important, therefore, that we go to Jesus, that we look to Jesus, that we trust in Jesus. But then also we will be so happy, deeply and eternally happy. Maybe let that be the last question of the service. The last question and the key question. Are you happy? Solomon says, happy are the wise. Is actually a very powerful word. It means, it means blessed. It means content. It means in your soul and spirit and with all your heart and life at peace and at rest and full of joy, in a way that whatever else happens, that center, that core, cannot ultimately be ruffled and disturbed. Are you happy like that? Not just emotionally happy, but down to your very core, happy. Don't all people want such happiness? But how many are looking for it anywhere else, but in that only place where it's to be found? with that only one with whom it's to be found. You cannot be happy without wisdom. You cannot be happy if you forget God's law. You will never be happy if you don't with your heart seek to keep His commands. It is impossible to be happy if you don't bow down to the all-wise Savior God in Jesus Christ saying, Save me, teach me. How special that He Himself calls you and me to that this morning. Yes, let's realize that. That more even than a father to his son, we may in our text hear the words of our covenant God to His covenant people, to you and to me. The Father speaks so tenderly and directly and urgently. My child, He says. He's saying that to every one of us. Happy are the wise. So happy. So be wise, therefore, and serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling and kiss the Son, the Savior, Son of God. Kiss Him today and all your days. That's the summons. That's the invitation. That's the counsel of our text. That's the wisdom of God. And when you are wise like that, You will be happy, infinitely, and forever. Amen.